Up until now, we've been talking about semiconductors in isolation. Just a semiconductor, perhaps doped with, so there are a lot of carriers inside of it. And we've talked a little bit about driving current through it and, and what the difference is between forward and reverse biasing of a PN junction. But we haven't really uh, systematically studied what happens to the carriers when you pass current through a semiconductor, and that's what we're going to start looking at today. So we're going to take our semiconductor out of equilibrium. Equilibrium is a condition where there really there's no current going through the semiconductor. And so the number of carriers in the semiconductor are the number of carriers you would calculate from equations 1.8.5 and 1.8.8. But when you leave equilibrium, you're writing current through the semiconductor, there are more carriers in it. We need then to talk about what that looks like. And so I'm going to start using this language too, a majority carrier, minority carrier. That's simply in the case of an n-type semiconductor, we call the electrons majority carriers and the holes minority, and for p-type the opposite. That will be kind of important now because when you have excess carriers, it actually matters more to have excess minority carriers than majority carriers. And we'll see why that makes a, a big difference on, on the uh, Fermi energy level. So this is what the carrier concentrations look like, how we're going to write them when there are excess carriers. So N sub zero and P sub zero are the carrier concentrations that you have without any current injection or any photoionization. So they're, they're what you would actually calculate from those two most important equations in the book. So the carrier density at equilibrium. And primed N and P are the excess carriers that you get into the semiconductor just by pushing them in from the outside. Um, you can either do that by hooking up wires and running a current through it or by shining a light on it and causing excess ionization. That's our structure for how to write it. So N0 and P0, you can continue determining the old fashioned way. But N prime and P prime is a different story. Now, one thing I would emphasize is no matter what you do, you cannot destroy charge neutrality in the entire semiconductor. You can always take that to be the case, which means if I cause there to be an excess of electrons, I have to cause there to be an excess of holes of the exact same number. Whatever N prime and P prime are, you can take them to be the same. So N prime equals P prime is, is a, a thing you want to write down because sometimes in solving a problem, you need to remember that that's true. Uh, another thing is how we calculated carrier concentration at equilibrium in the past. N sub i, remember, is the intrinsic carrier concentration. It still equals the square root of NP, but which ones? It's the N sub 0, P sub 0. That remains true. But the excess carriers don't participate in that relation. So I can't say that NP under square root is N sub i, the intrinsic carrier concentration. It's just the equilibrium carrier concentrations that go into that relation. The primed values change things. So the, this is not a true statement when you have excess carriers present. Even with excess carriers present, this remains a true statement. These just describe the equilibrium values. How do you get an N prime and a P prime, and how do you get rid of them? You can generate them just by injecting them, and that's usually what we're going to consider, except when we're doing uh, optoelectronics. Another question, though, is where, are they, where can they go? Because you have two processes actually that balance out. There's, there's generation and there's recombination. We actually need to model the recombination because it, it affects device performance. There are two mechanisms by which recombination might be seen to occur, and they're illustrated in this little band diagram. For a direct band gap semiconductor, it's not uncommon just to have the electron find a hole in the valence band and go home, at which case energy is emitted. It could be a photon. It could be thermalization of a phonon, which it more likely is unless you actually have an optoelectronic device. In the case of an indirect band gap semiconductor, that's not likely to happen because the electrons and the holes aren't pointing the same way in K space. Their momentum vectors don't line up. What you're more likely to see happen with an indirect band gap semiconductor like silicon is trap level recombination, where the electron finds a state in the gap, which is, there are a lot of them due to impurities and, and, and crystal imperfections. 
and it finds a trap level that enables it, that assists it to make its way to the valence band. That trap basically corrects the momentum mismatch between the electron and the hole. Those are the two mechanisms. And we don't have to spend a whole lot of time diving into those mechanisms like we would in a solid state physics course. We're going to go with the modeling that is applicable to both. They both have time constants. If you let an electron hover around in the conduction band long enough, it's going to go home. And there is an exponential decay that characterizes the density of, of electrons up there in the conduction band if you just put a bunch there and watch. And so the excess electron carrier concentration has a decay with time, and so does the excess hole concentration. Tau is the recombination lifetime. Those are the same tau because, after all, electrons recombine with holes. So whatever the electron population is doing, the hole population is doing. Tau is the recombination lifetime. It's a lot longer than the scattering relaxation time, and I want to bring this to your attention now, that it's, this is the second use of tau in this chapter for two completely different things. Previously, we used tau, the letter tau, as the symbol for the scattering relaxation time, which is a whole, a whole different thing. This is not the same thing. This is recombination. Everybody calls them both tau. So when you say it, you, you got to say which one you're talking, which process you're talking about, or else people are confused. It helps to unconfuse that is that the scattering relaxation is a very fast process. The time between scattering events, it's about a picosecond or less. Recombination, on the other hand, takes a long time by comparison to that. It takes anywhere, I, I say several microseconds here, but actually it takes anywhere from from several nanoseconds to uh, milliseconds. It's a very broad range depending on the quality of the crystal, and so it is not a reliable quantity. You can't really look in a book, say, where's the recombination lifetime for silicon? Uh, you won't find something because it depends on so many difficult to control characteristics of the material. But let's talk about what it is, because we're going to use that tau in equations. It's just that at some point we have to be able to, to say what it is or get rid of it. Let's talk about its physical meaning in terms of a word equation. The rate that electrons recombine with holes, if we just think about one electron finding a hole, if it takes a time tau, then you could say that the rate that that happened was one over tau. And so if you have a, a, a population of electrons that have to find a population of holes and go home, the, the rate is going to happen, you can say, is one over tau times the number of electrons or holes that there are. And so I'll say that the recombination rate is the number of excess carriers, because those are the only ones that, that participate, the excess carriers, per unit volume. So it's, this is a per unit volume rate divided by the, the average time that it takes an electron and hole to find each other and recombine. We'll call P prime over tau or N prime over tau. Uh, they're the same. They're equal. That's the recombination rate. Now about this tau, you know, it's a very unreliable number. It's really not well defined because of uh, the quality of the crystal, impurities, those traps are, you know, a consequence of either defects or impurities, and they simply, you know, make tau take a long time because it, uh, an electron can drop into a trap level and stay there for a while. For silicon, tau can vary from one nanosecond to 100 microseconds. So we'll come back next time and talk about what effect having an excess in carriers has on the Fermi energy. And we're going to introduce a vague concept called the quasi-Fermi energy, which is important enough that you do want to pay attention to it. Don't uh, brush it off because it's uh, a little abstract.